armed with that information about soil conditions and all this and that, um, the other big piece of the puzzle, so we've talked a little bit about hydrology, we've talked a little bit about the soil structure and this and that. Um, now we need to mention uh, some of the critters that, and the, crit and the food webs and the interactions and things like that that happen in our systems and our systems that we're restoring. We'll do a quick, super quick run through of community ecology, of, of some of the key ideas that are relevant to restoration ecology. Then we'll talk about some different areas, and then we'll talk about actual critters. Um, I think the most important parts from community ecology that, that pertain to you guys, and, and as we think about restoring wetlands in particular, are one, the importance of having a simplified system. So we're, rarely are we taking a huge complex system, nuking it, and then reinstalling a huge new complex system. We usually install a simplified system with fewer uh, plant species, fewer individuals, that type of stuff, with the idea that we'd like it to be on a trajectory that it would eventually become more um, complex or sophisticated. But um, nevertheless, we start almost always with simplified systems. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. That's how we proceed with a lot of community ecology in general, regardless of the applied world. It's just these things are so complex, it's hard to get a handle on a thousand species interacting. It's easier to get a handle on five species interacting. Now, the key uh, concept is zonation. The, the uh, distribution of organisms by uh, th over space. Typically, this is on an elevational gradient. And then succession. So the theory of, of succession and how that relates to restoration will be hopefully obvious. So let's start talking about zonation first. Zonation is we're defining for our class as the repeated or consistent spatial pattern in organisms distribution. Meaning, as we look out on, at this site, we uh, observe a certain pattern, go to another site miles down the road, see us, that may have found exact, a very similar pattern, go several miles down the road, see that pattern again. While zonation applies to life, it's really easiest to see with sessile organisms, with site-attached organisms barnacles and invertebrates, plants in the wetland, that uh, type of stuff. It's also easiest to see where we have the most stark elevational, con uh, elevational change. And we typically think about rest, uh, zonation excuse me, as um, occurring over a small area, say, over three meters in height or something like that, but, but do realize that it happens at multiple spatial scales, but the scale that we're typically talking about is, is sort of the height of a human or the height of a couple humans somewhere in that, in that range. So the classic place that we uh, have taken zonation from is the intertidal. And... Uh, this, this is really the birthplace of modern quantitative ecology, people using statistics to look at relationships, et cetera. Um, and the intertidal has been super, super helpful in, in clarifying a lot of theory and, and concepts and ideas. I'm illustrating this here in Southern California with a rocky intertidal uh, area. What we have is, this is, go, this is the subtitle. So this is the area that um, down here would be wet all the time. This area would be this area would be wet most of the time, but every once in a while, a few times a year, it might get dry because the because the extreme low tides. Um, and then and then on and on and on and on. And then up here we have the area that gets really almost no tide or maybe just some ocean spray, right? So we go from this super, super dry condition to, to totally wet condition. And what you see is we have some critters that hang out in the dry or, 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 or are most abundant in the dry. We have some critters that are most abundant in the super wet. And as we go up that, that elevational scale, 
we see this different pattern repeated over and over again. So this is what this looks like at one of our monitoring sites at Leo Carrillo uh, State Beach. So if we just glance at it, you know, knowing nothing else, knowing, knowing not even know what the organisms are, you guys can see pattern there, right? What's the pattern? You guys, tell me some of the patterns you guys see here. Right, muscles up high, good. Starfish at the bottom, good. What else? Barnacles are kind of everywhere. Barnacles are, okay, so. Okay, so Hayden said they're everywhere, but yeah, they're, they're, there's, a, there's a band of barnacles. It might be wide, but there's a band of barnacles, okay. Right, so that's seagrass. So that's, that's down low in the water, right? So we see that green, that, that, those, those, that green, it's actually an angiosperm, a flowering plant, unusual. Uh, oh, good question. That would not be considered rack because it's actually attached to the rocks. If that just, if knowing nothing else, if you just saw this picture, you could think maybe it was rack. But this stuff is actually, um, most of this is actually still attached, so it would not be considered rack. Rack is tissue that has broken off from the rest of the plant and is free floating. It might not be dead, but it's sort of on its way to dying. In this case, this stuff is mostly alive and, and kicking. So good. So okay. So right. So so what's going on here, right, is the it is that angiosperm, that grass, that terrestrial plant that lives underwater, super bizarre, um, doesn't have uh, great mechanisms to take drying out. So it needs to be wet. The mussels are up high, right? The mussels, the mussels have really tight shells. They squeeze their mussels, which is primarily what you get when you eat mussels in a, in a stew or something. You're mostly eating their, the, <laughs> the mussels muscle. Right, so the the adductor muscle. So so the uh, yeah. So spelling with you better make sure you spell the right muscle when I say that. But um, and so those guys are really good at pulling that muscle tight and and clamping those two valves. They're a bivalve. They're a two shelled mollusk of keeping their shell closed and keeping their their wetness inside of them. Right, not drying out. So the, so they're they're pretty good at that. Um, they're not everywhere. They're not lower. Why, why aren't they lower than they are? Do you guys have, do you guys recall? They right, the starfish predate them. So the starfish are, so as good as the mussels are at keeping their shells closed, the starfish are even better. And they have a, a hydro, they have a skeleton that works on water pressure and stuff. And so they, they can, they can, they'll always win. If it's ever a contest between a starfish and a mussel, the starfish will always, always, always win. And so, um, so they're really good at eating them. So the issue is the starfish can't, uh, doesn't have a great resistance to being dry. And so those guys can only go so high. So if you check them out, even right now in the low tide, they're not just doo doo hanging out in the rock, right? They're in these cracks where it's going to be a little bit more humid, a little bit more wet, a little less stressful for them. So now if the tide comes up, they'll start walking around the whole rock and cruising everywhere. But the notion is, the bottom of the muscle band is pretty much as high as the starfish can get to on a routine tidal cycle. Make sense? But so we're, so we're seeing these patterns in, in distribution, so we'd call this zonation. Now, while we, we think about that, we often credit the great naturalist Ed Ricketts as first codifying that in his, his uh, famous book, Between Pacific Coast Tides. Um, we see the same thing in salt marshes. Salt marsh, just like the intertidal, it's influenced by high tides, low tides. Just it's on a soft bottom. It, it's, it's a muddy bottom as opposed to a rocky bottom. So if we look across this salt marsh, we see essentially the same thing. Now, we're talking about plants, and some of these plants are, are sometimes the same genus, just different species. So it, it takes a little bit of a more refined eye, but if we start looking, we see the same thing. And it's following the same exact patterns as we saw in the rocky intertidal. Some things are better at and can tolerate being underwater. Some things are better at being in the air. And so things are segregating in space based on those, uh, on their physiological constraints and the ecological interactions with their fellow organisms. So for example, here's, an exa here, here's a picture from the East Coast. And there are actually two different species of Spartina growing here. It might be, again, a little hard for you guys to tell, but, but you can tell that one looks more like tufty in the foreground, more like you know, tufts of hair, and in the 
background it looks more homogeneous so that's not just looks those are actually different uh, different species and uh, again so, so same same idea um, here now we're just talking about our example our example here in Southern California in this case this is a diagram from a restoration plan for Bolsa Chica down south of us um, a restoration that was done about oh god getting old, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago now? And so we see, uh, in this case, relatively simplified, again, relative to the intertidal patterns that are so obvious, but we have the water, then the mud, and we have the Spartina zone, and then we have the, the pickleweed zone higher up. And then from there, we transition into more terrestrial systems out of the wetland. And this is what that looks like on one of our areas. So this is, um, this was, uh, this is the Malibu Lagoon restoration. This is before our current restorations. So this was the restoration we did more like 20, whatever, five years ago or so. Um, so what we're looking at here is we're looking at the back of the marsh. Again, this, so this, is, this has been all recontoured and changed. So we'll, we'll, if you guys go out there and try to take the same picture, you won't see it. But it makes a point, right? We have the wet water area. Then we transition going a little bit higher into this muddy mud flat area and then there's actually a rack zone that you guys see there so those sticks and twigs and floating debris have been left uh, at that area and then we hit um, in this case what is it it looks like uh, there's some jaumea in there and and that and then we go up a little higher and we probably get into some disticlus and and etc again not knowing the species now you guys can just look at it and you can see that visually right you can see that layering of color in this case so we have zonation in our salt marshes as well. Um, in general, the story I'll give you guys for our salt marshes in California is going gonna, is gonna to be like this. So on the left, we have the water. And then once we come out of the water, we're going to be in um, a, a mud flat area. So th this cartoon is based on a tidal channel, a tidal creek. But the same thing applies to lagoon areas and wherever. So we're going to start with something like Spartina foliosa, a native, not the invasive. I mean, the invasive would be there too. The invasive would be kind of everywhere, but, <clears throat> but well, let's talk about a generalized thing to start with. So we have our, our, our Spartina foliosa. Then we get Salicornia virginica. You should put an asterisk by Salicornia virginica. We'll talk about that later. Um, but uh, for now, just it's pickleweed. And then when we start to get up to the, the higher areas that are only infrequently touched by tidal inundation, um, that's where we get more of our, typically more of our diverse uh, plant palettes. So that's where we get the Frankenias, that's where we get um, the, um, I can't tell you, it's like, a, it's like I haven't slept lately, uh, the Battis and all, all that other kind of stuff. So Spartina down low, Salicornia, middle, main plain area, and then a lot of other stuff as we get higher. In terms of our looking at the biomass, what is pretty common in our part of California is this pattern, which is, it's the same pattern I just showed you, but it tends, the Spartina tends to be not super dense. We don't see this kind of things that happen in San Francisco Bay down here uh, on average. So, so we de definitely have plants and everything, but it tends to be relatively lightly vegetated down low, more heavily vegetated in the mid elevation areas, and then we get to the high elevation areas. That's where we get a lot of plant biomass um, and a lot of, a lot of and not much open space, not much bare ground. Um, cool. Okay, so there we go. So that, that's a little bit about zonation. Next thing, let's talk about succession. So here we're talking about, the, what's the classic succession story you guys read about in your ecology textbooks? Do you guys remember? Fires. Not fires. Well, I mean. What? So the classic one, well, maybe, maybe I'm old and I've used a different textbook. What's that? Uh, kind of, yeah, kind of. So the classic one. Yes, right. So the classic one is sort of the, the forested meadow type story, right? Where we start off and it's a pond. And, it's, and so this is usually told from the perspective of plants. 
So from the perspective of the pond, there are no flowering plants, uh, right? There, 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 there are no, um, there might be some algae, but there's, there's no big plants around there. So it's a, it's a pond. And then something happens, it could be a fire or whatever, and sediment comes into the, in, you know, erodes, starts eroding and, and goes into that pond, fills in that pond, and it goes from a, more of a lake to more of a marsh type setting, and then becomes sort of a wetland, a little fen typically. And then, and then from there, uh, it sediments in a little bit more, and then it becomes more like a wet meadow, then it becomes more like a grassland, then it becomes a shrubland, forested, etc. So that's usually told from the perspective of foresters. They're the ones that first talked about this. And so, it's, and so that's a classic story. And the notion is that we're, we're following a succession. One community is succeeding on the heels of another community and taking its place. And then in turn, they are, uh, th they are changed by the next wave that comes through. Um, and so, and so we, you can see that, for example, uh, here in our intertidal areas as well. So this is a classic study uh, done by um, Wayne Souza many, many years ago. But um, in the species don't matter, the species, ulva is a, is a very ephemeral, a thin green algae, really, really quick growing. So it's the weed, right? And then what you see here, so he went in and he nuked some areas, right? He cleared off some areas, so there was now no algae there. And then he just followed them. He came back and he said, okay, I'm going to go back this month and see what's there. I'm going to go back the next month and next month. And this is what you see. So this is what he found. So this is um, a cleaned up pretty graph. For, it's not his original graph, but basically it says, how much cover are these things? So we start off and early on, boom, this early successional species, ulva comes in and ulva dominates. The green line spikes, boom. And then after some period of time, some other slower growing, a slightly less weedy species, take a little bit longer to, to germinate or establish or get there, whatever the case may be. But eventually they do get a toehold. Eventually they get a toehold and they start, and they start uh, you know, doing their due and then they start, start growing, growing, growing and, and then they displace the, the ulvas of the world. And, and we see some pattern through time. So we'll, we often see something like, again, the species don't matter, but this gelidium, the, the light blue line the light blue line is the winner. If we don't do anything, if all we did was disturb the plot to start with and then didn't do anything, we'll oftentimes get a winner or a small handful of winners. We would refer to those as the competitive dominant, right? So those guys are the best over the long term. They're best able to kick everybody else's butt and take over, right? I'd also point out in this figure that um, diversity is highest where? Not at the end. In the middle, right, in the middle, right? It, things are more evenly, and so we define diversity not just as a number of things, but how, but, um, and here I'm talking about the, the broader sense of diversity, not some simplistic species richness that sometimes people talk about as being the same thing, it's different. So we can imagine, we can imagine here, uh, what's more diverse, right? Is it more diverse having so if, if uh, we have four color marbles in a bag and I have one red, one blue, one yellow, and then 97 greens, right? That's four, uh, that's four species in the bag, but, but most of them are hardly there at all. Or 25 of the red, 25 of the white, you know, et cetera, like that. So that's gonna be more diverse, right? Because we, we're more likely to encounter more different things. It's not gonna be dominated by a few. And we tend to see that in the middle part of these of these arcs. So is that like abundance versus diversity? This graph? The, yeah, well, what you just said. Uh, so the question is, um, so does that have to do with abundance and things? Uh, in this case, uh, maybe, maybe not. It depends on the species as to how much biomass and things like that that they have and how many individuals um, they make. I'm talking about, in this case, we're talking about the percent cover. So that would be the thing. Uh, okay, so in practice, for us, in salt marsh ecology, salt marsh succession <laughs> is really going to follow from uh, nuked area, from cleared area, from disturbed area, to a more biomass abundant, plant abundant, what we might call mature community. 
you sometimes hear the word natural selection. That's, that's the same thing as ecological succession. Um, and oftentimes, this is what we're trying to do with our restorations. Because again, we can't put every single plant in the world in there, but we want to sort of get the system on track so that these food, so that these these food webs develop more complexly, these ecological communities develop more complexly, um, and so we're trying to help, sort of push, oftentimes push us down, the path to to a more mature state, of uh, ecological succession. Uh, every once in a while, in the context of restoration, you'll get some people that say that that's cheating, right? And usually this is in the context of something like an oil spill. So the oil spill comes in, nukes the, nukes the wetland, and then you know, people like us come on in and we plant some plants. And we plant you know, a few plants, let's say. And sometimes the public comes up and goes, what are you doing? This is lame, you're letting these guys off the hook. You haven't, you haven't made all the plants come back like you said you would. And the answer is, no, we understand that, but we're trying to set the stage so that with succession, right, with the natural evolution of this system, it will, it will go to what we like. But sometimes the public doesn't really understand that. And so that is a source of contention sometimes in, in restoration planning and things. In general, for us, in our salt marshes, since we're, um, we mostly, with the, with the organisms, we typically focus on the vegetation first as the first cut and try to get that right um, when it comes to organisms. Uh, and so for, from the plant's perspective, this is what the successional pattern will be for our Southern California wetlands, for example. It'll start with open water, and then um, over time it'll fill in, or again, we can talk about this going up an elevational gradient. Um, uh, then it'll go to mudflat, sparsely vegetated marsh, then, then those plants are, are able to catch more sediment, retain more sediment, and, and uh, by dying have more um, organics and stuff in the soil, essentially enrich the soil, make it better able to support plant growth. And then we get the more abundant marsh conditions that we have lots of biomass and, and individuals and everything. And then if nothing else happens, oftentimes there'll be a competitive dominant that'll come in there. Does that make sense? Questions? So it's important to be careful, and this is really <coughs> easy to fall into this trap when we're talking about ecological restoration. So it's, it's, it's typical to think about number five, let's say, as the goal. And it's typical to think of number five as the quote unquote good thing, right? Don't use those words. Don't use judgmental words like that. Um, this is a huge problem for ecology because we use regular words. We use the term competition. We use the term um, you know, facilitation. Things that everybody understands. If we had, for our ecological concepts, if we had words like quark, right, and gluon, right, stuff like that, people wouldn't be uptight, right? We'd say whatever and it'd be fine. But because our language is because the terminology that we use for a lot of our stuff is shared by our um, fellow English speakers, a lot of times people think they understand what we're talking about. And that's led to a lot of confusion around things like evolution and discussing evolution, et cetera. In the context, so for example, Darwin, when Darwin wrote, wrote Origin of the Species, he wrote in the margins of his notes, never use the term higher or lower never refer to a higher organism or a lower organism. Why? Because everything that's here right now is a success. Humans are a success. Those microbes are a success. Everything's a success, right? Everything is constantly evolving. And this notion of higher and lower comes from this stupid worldview where humans are the only thing that matter and humans are dominant, dominant and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot, of, a lot of cultural baggage that comes along with that. Don't think that way. For a restoration of, for a healthy restora, for a healthy salt marsh, excuse me, we should have all of these six things down there, all those elements. And simply having one or the other is not bad, necessarily, right? 
be careful be careful with with uh, words that that apply value judgments to these ecological systems also note in this successional framework that we're thinking in there's always going to be some some dudes that are on the way out there's always gonna be some dudes that are on the ascendancy and that's just the way it is so um, there are no real perennial winners there are no real perennial losers I suggest it's best to think of these systems as early, middle, and late successional times, as opposed to, you know, best or worst or or other terms. Um, and then I just say here, if you do use words such as better, you must stipulate better for whom or what. So if we are talking about the habitat for one species of bird, then yes, then maybe one of these one of these conditions is better, of course, or is worse, but. Uh, you must, you know, make sure you put it in that context, because there's a, the, something, you know, the the microbes that love to eat oil love the oil spills, right? So in those cases, those guys, hey, it's great for them to have an oil spill, for example. Okay, so uh, since a lot of times, I just after all that kind of discussion, a lot of times the thing that we we're most light on, that we're most missing is indeed the more mature side of that equation, the more mature um, uh, community. And so because of that, I want to just run through what we, what we see in a mature community. Um, again, put an asterisk around Salicornia virginica. We, we'll talk about that when we get to the organisms. <clears throat> but if you were doing a restoration plan, say for a coastal wetland, coastal salt marsh here, these would be some of the things you would, you would list. So upland transition would be things like salicornia, pickleweed, and we're, I'm going to show you what these things all look like uh, in a bit here. But uh, pickleweed, uh, salt grass, uh, all these guys um, would be the upland transition, and that's the area that's just on the edge, the upper edge of the marsh, transitioning to area that's not jurisdictional wetland, transitioning to what we would call the upland, the more terrestrial areas. Uh, then we have our high marsh which uh, is, is still high, but not, not as high as the transition. Mid-marsh is very, very commonly a salicornia monoculture or very close to a monoculture, very large, extensive stands of just typically one species. And then low would be something like uh, either Spartina, which we don't have that much of in most of our Southern California marshes. We tend to have uh, a different species. So let's look at what happens. So uh, the succession happens not just because humans are messing with the system. Coastal salt marshes are, are, are a disturbance uh, experiencing system and they've been experiencing disturbance long before humans ever came in the picture. Humans are messing with the disturbance. We're making more disturbance and more frequent disturbance. But, the, but just the basic idea of disturbance is an is a ongoing thing with these systems. So let's take a look. So here's an example from Ormond Beach. This is a salt pan. So this is an area that is in, elevationally, is in an area where we would expect there to be plants growing, right? We, if we look to the right, we see plants. If we look to the left, we see plants. And there maybe it looks like there's a little dip in the, dip in the surface of the land, but it's, you know, it's, 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 it's there. Um, and so, we're going to talk about this in, our, in the vegetated plane. We're going to talk about this as the starting point. So if, if, we, if we have a disturbance, if we come in with, with a restoration, we essentially put the sediment down, and that's the first starting point. We got the sediment. Um, oh, actually, one thing I want to say. Uh, so have a look at the uh, – you, you see there, there's a – I took this picture in August. We see this bathtub ring. Let me know why we have that bathtub ring there. So what's happened is, is that, oh, good guess. It's not minerals. It's actually just salt. It's just salt, and the and the pink are um, bacteria, archaea, that are growing in this super saline area. What's happening is the tides have come up, or the river. This, this not that uh, no river in this case. This is just summertime. This is just this is just. Uh, High tide. So high tide came up, made water everywhere. High tide has gone out, but there's a little teeny depression. So some of that seawater is a little bit trapped, right? A couple inches of seawater. Uh, we're in Southern California. 
right? We're in a Mediterranean ecosystem. We're very hot in the summertime. So that hot, hot sun is hitting that water and making that water hot, 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 hot. Eventually, it makes it hot enough that some of that water evaporates. So the H2O molecules go up in the air. The salt stays behind. So we start off with salinity that's seawater. And then as, it, as, it, uh, as we go through the day or through the days, whatever, depending, that seawater salinity, say it's starting off at 34 parts per thousand, it's then going to go to 36 parts per thousand, 37, 38, 39. So it's becoming super saline or hyper saline. And so then it's really, then it's really hard to make, a, I mean, it's, it's hard for these plants to live in salt water anyway. Now we're making it Superman salt water, right? So it's, oh my gosh. <laughs> and so the only thing macroscopic you can see growing in this area are the microbes, right? So some of these bacteria, these are the same kind of things that live in hot springs in Yellowstone, right? They can take these very hot, um, uh, uh, hot salty water and they can still manage to grow. And so you're seeing this bathtub ring because the because the water is evaporating, right? It's it's sort of dropping down, and for for uh, the, these bacteria do need some water though, right? They're not pure dry. So the, the, essentially, the bacteria are walking down. I mean, they're not they're not walking, but they have such a fast generational time. These guys are dead, right? This guy is probably a little bit too too uh, too hot for them or something, right? So they're they're kind of in this like Goldilocks. They're in the not too hot, not too cold. And so these guys are growing. And then as it dries out, this, these guys die. And the guys that are born here, that divide here, they live. And so we're seeing this, this remnant of essentially a bacterial footprint. So there we go. Okay, so we start off with our salt pan. And that's no vegetation. Uh, if we're going higher up, this is our, this is our more complex uh, you know, mid-marsh area where we have a monoculture of, of salicornia. This is pickle weed. Um, disturbance. Uh, so the, que the next question is, um, this can become this pretty easily. How does this become this? Well, we could crash a car into the wetland and kill the plants. We could have uh, any number of things. This, so we typically think of this as a physical disturbance, an abiotic disturbance, something coming in and killing the plants like rack, rack coming in, floating in, landing, and then smothering the plants and just squishing them or starving them of light. But life can do this as well. So we don't typically have cows grazing in the intertidal anymore, as some people do in some parts of the world. But um, in this case, here's, here's a parasitical plant. So this is Cuscuta, or, or daughter is the, is the common name. We have, I believe it's 24 or something, species of Cuscuta in California. Some have specialized to live on plants up in the Sierras. Some are specialized to live in grassland, all these different, all these different ones. But basically what we're talking about is, so here is the pickleweed. Here's the green plant that's sort of the main, main mover and shaker in our, in our mid-marsh plain. But then this orange stuff is a different plant. Okay, so it's almost like a vine. You might think of it like a vine that's creeping up a tropical tree. And these guys uh, are a parasite and they're going to jam their little, essentially, suckers into the flesh of these succulent plants, meaning that they hold a lot of water. And they're going to suck them dry. And so this plant, it's orange, right? It's not the typical green. It's not the typical photosynthesizing. Uh, it's not the typical plant that's trying to make every single part of its tissue be photosynthetic. Instead, this guy is working on um, making tendrils that can attack more plant stems and suck out more of the, the life-giving um, liquids and sugars and things like that from uh, those guys. So, so this is when it starts. When it gets more intense, you, these th the plants can look orange, like completely covered in this membrane of, of parasitical tendrils. And if you look, have a look. See this guy? He's all plump. He's circular. He looks like a cone, a cylinder. Not a cone, a cylinder. Check out this guy. Look at him. He looks like um, we, we stuck, a, stuck a syringe in and squirt, sucked out all the water. And that's literally what's happened. All that 
all that material, all that sugar, all that water has been sucked out of the green plant and it's now in the white plant. In this case, it's near the end of its life cycle. So, so daughter, again, the common name is D-O-D-D-E-R, daughter, Cascuda is the genus, um, uh, is near, it's an annual. So this does, doesn't live for years and years. It's got a gr growing season, it dies. So this guy is now sucked off. You know, basically the vampires parasitize that poor victim and getting ready to reproduce. So the, the daughter has set flowers, right? So now it's just like, a, it's an andrew sperm. So it's just like, you know, it's gonna be pollinated and it's gonna set seeds and those seeds are gonna, you know, eventually germinate and start the process all over. So here's what that looks like in practice from one of our sites. So here is, here's some of the green plants, right? So that was what was here before, a monoculture of this stuff. And then check it out. So this daughter has been at work, right? So it, and then, and so that's going on. This is the dead daughter. So this is the dead daughter and the dead salicornia. So this is where it started, the infection started here and it started killing plants and then it's spreading and it's just constantly spreading, right? So this, here's the front of the infection. Here's the front of the infection here. Um, and, uh, and this is a big open hole. So in other words, this biological interaction, in this case, parasitism, is causing disturbance in the plant community. So we can get disturbance from any number of factors. Um, uh, most typically, though, we think about this in the form of, of rack deposition. So rack, either rack coming from the ocean or much more of a management concern for us and a lot of the wetlands we work on restoring here in Southern California have stuff coming down the watershed. So in this case, we're looking at, um, let's see, China Camp, this is an invasive, this is invasive Spartina racks. This is the dead stems of the invaders. Um, and then this is a, a similar project. I was helping my friend out up in, up in uh, Washington. Some of you guys know John Lambrinos. He, this, is, this was his postdoctoral project. Anyway, um, so this stuff will also kill the plants, just like the daughter will, right? It'll, it'll physically crush the plants. <coughs> And uh, if it's there long enough, it'll actually make them die because they can't get enough photosyn photosynthesis, right? It'll make, it's, make, it's like putting a black tarp over them. Um, so here what I've done is I've gone and I've pulled off some of these stems. And what you see inside are all of these, German, all these seeds trying to germinate. But if you look at them, they are what the botanist would call ateliated, meaning they're white. See, see how these look, look like bean sprouts, right? that you guys might get at the, uh, in the restaurant if you're, if you're all healthy and you guys like to eat salads and stuff. <laughs> and so, the, and then, and look at the, look at the, and then these guys, there's a little bit of light. So these guys are green, but look at these leaves. The leaves are even yellow. So if I hadn't pulled this rack off, these seeds germinated, but they would have died, right? So they had the right temperature. They had the right moisture to germinate, but they germinated. And the idea is, oh, the, the seed thinks he's, you know, a couple millimeters under the soil. It's like, okay, let's use our, our energy reserves and grow to the surface. But then they're like, wait, what? It's not the surface yet. Let me grow a little more. Wait, what? And so, so basically this plant is on, a, these, these germlings are on their way to dying because they're not gonna be able to get through the foot, the foot thick of, of uh, rack before they, um, before they uh, uh, consume all their energy reserves. So, okay, so we have disturbance. So we have disturbance from biological sources, we have disturbance from physical sources, and, and a lot of the stuff that's coming on the watershed is human-induced. They're either invasive species that we've allowed to be there, or it's just trash. In places like Tijuana National Estuary Research Reserve, it's almost all, you know, um, by trash I mean like refrigerators and stuff, tires, baby diapers, stuff like that. So, um, so from the perspective of disturbance, it all in the, in the context of succession, at least, not talking about pollution and toxins, but just from the successional standpoint, that's sort of the starting point. So go back to our salt pan. So this would be the early part of it. Then we'll have some of these early colonizers come in. So in this case, this is, what is this? This is Batis, uh, Batis meridima. And check it out. Um, this plant is, so here's, here's pickleweed, salicornia, to give you some scale. This is, you know, I don't know, a couple feet high, right? This is 30 centimeters high, say, this plant canopy. This plant is not. This plant is hugging the ground. So how this plant is, is working in, in similar plants, uh, for whatever reason, this got, so the seed got here and started to grow. And he's starting to spread out. Check it out. This is harsh, right? This is this denuded area, 
all of these denuded areas will be saltier than the areas with plants, regardless of, regardless of uh, what else is going on. Because when they're exposed to the sun, it's going to be that same process of water is going to evaporate more quickly than under the areas with, shaded, with shade. And so it's going to tend to be more salty. So these bare areas are always more challenging for the plants to live in. Okay, we got we have our we have our plant. So that, so forever. So somehow this guy got going right here and started going and okay, cool, started to grow. But then he's thrown out these runners, these surface runners, and spreading out over. So if you're a plant, one of the things, one of the key resources you need is sunlight, right? If this plant was trying to grow in here, he's kind of screwed, right? It's all the shade. It's hard to do that. Over here, if you can take the, if you can tolerate the hard place to live, it's a, it's free sun, man. You know, so you know, I'm sure the Trump family would love to live here because they can just suntan all day long, right? So um, they would have to use their fake artificial tan. So, so this, um, so this is, this is a, you know, a, a approach that's helping this plant survive, but. It's also ameliorating. Now it's here, it's actually shading that area and it's making it a little less salty, making it a little bit easier for other plants to come in behind it, right? And here's, here's a, a even better picture where you see, this is one of our, this is the one of the restorations I did at Magoo and you see this huge long runner, right? F meters and meters and meters away from any other plants. And, uh, and those guys are, that guy's getting the dude done. Okay, so next, next, then that guy keeps doing it. And then another guy does another guy. And eventually we have this plant community, very so thin, not as high, but now we filled in that salt pan. So this area right here was used to be a salt pan. It used to be a bare, bare ground area. But now it's been filled up with these, which you could consider the early successional plants, right? They filled it all in. But now that they filled it all in, oh snap, right? Now the salicornias and the other plants that, 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 can outcompete them, they can start squeezing on in their turf, right? So they can now move into that area. And that's what you see. So here's a salt pan that's many years old. And this used to be a salt pan here. You can't tell, right? We have a whole mix. And so it's, it's a diverse community. It's becoming like, it's that, it's that, it's that, um, that culmination of stuff. And then um, this, would, this would be an even later in the story. So check it out. Now we have essentially a monoculture there, right? The best competitor said, elbowed everybody else out, eventually elbowed everybody out. So that's, the, that's our pattern in our Southern California coastal salt marsh. So I just want to give you a precautionary principle before we go on and start talking about actual, actual individuals. Um, so all these things we just mentioned. So this, this is my quick and dirty community ecology for you guys for surviving restoration. Uh, zonation, succession, and other patterns are, a, are an emergent thing that we observe that comes at the end of a bunch of stuff. The end of the bunch of stuff is the evolutionary heritage of these plants. Some plants have evolved to deal well with salt. Some plants have evolved to have these runners, um, all that kind of stuff. And, and those, that pattern, those skills that's not skills, but, but the, the, those attributes, I should say, have worked very well, right? These are all the winners that we have here now. These are all the plants that have survived all the changing sea levels and all this and that. Cool. The world we are entering is becoming upended with uh, many things, mostly just the massive human footprint we have on the planet, but especially in the case of coastal salt marshes, climate change. And so, so while we use these tools and these theories and these things, that, and you guys should keep using them, you always need to keep on the back of your mind that our world is having more and more perturbations, more and more disturbances, in this case, to say our coastal salt marshes. And so we should pr be very, very cautious about saying these patterns will always work out this way. So in some of our more disturbed areas, I'm starting to see some of the plants that I would normally say is a, are a high, high marsh species starting to show up in the low elevations. And I don't, 
understand why that's happening. One, it's maybe because I'm not smart, but two, it could be because we're seeing these different relationships emerge as the stressors change. That's not to say I don't want you to, to learn these old successional patterns. We are going to learn them. We are going to use them. But, but I, it's really important for me to make sure you guys understand that all the stuff we're talking about, we're learning from what's happened in the past. And the future is becoming increasingly hard to predict. Just be honest. If you guys, if you guys do do restoration stuff in the future or you're reading about a story or something, realize that you know, we should be careful with our assumptions that, that these ecological interactions will always work out as they have in the past. There's good reason to think they, they won't. How, how much they will differ is unclear. OK, maybe we'll do, um, yeah, OK, we'll do this, and then we'll take a quick break here. You guys can uh, stretch for a second. So, let's, so here I want to talk about some of the, the um, key regions for, say, our coastal salt marshes that we're going to focus on for a while here. Um, we've already touched on these, but just so you guys have them down, we're talking about uh, the, the aquatic area, the, the area that's always wet, so the lagoon, if you will. Then we go into uh, another key area is going to be tidal creeks. Uh, broad, flat expanses of sediment, we call those mud flats. And then was, as we've just been talking about, we have lower marsh, mid marsh, upper marsh. And then we typically talk about the terrestrial areas as the upland. Rel this is from a wetland centric perspective, right? The upland. Um, we can also talk about, um, so, th so those are just sort of different regions of the marsh. We can also talk about going from the ocean in towards the interior part of California. And so for there, the tr the, the transition is actually much more complex. We're not just talking about wetlands. And so we there usually start with a beach or the fore dune, meaning the dunes that are facing the ocean spray. The back dune, the dunes that are behind that, they tend to be much more heavily vegetated, much more diverse, have a lot more. Um, and and the, the, the fore dunes tend to be dunes that move around a lot because they're not heavily vegetated, so the wind moves them. The back dunes tend to be more vegetated, and they tend to be more stable. Um, salt marsh, we've, that's what we've been talking about here, salt marsh. Brackish marsh, so that's going to be the area, wetland area, that's a bit closer to the river or farther up the river. That is not pure freshwater, but it's, it's fresher. If we keep going farther up that freshwater source, we could get to actually pure freshwater marshes that don't have any salt in them at all, only freshwater species. Along that whole water corridor, we have riparian communities. We have, uh, can have scrublands. We can have woodlands as we go farther up. And uh, as we go into places like the Oxnard Plain, we typically hit more grassland, type, or would have if there weren't farms, or hit grassland community and chaparral. So the grassland chaparral would be drier than the shrubland woodland. Okay, next I want to go over some of the basic adaptations that plants have to, to live in these uh, stressful situations. And primarily, I want to talk about uh, the approaches plants have evolved to deal with salinity, to deal with anoxia or low oxygen, and then uh, physical breaking due to um, water movement or hydrologic shear. So the plants that we're talking about that live in our salt marsh, most of them, if there's a few in the very upland transition that, aren't, that wouldn't be considered uh, halophytes, but but uh, these guys, most of what we're talking about are um, salt growing plants or plants that can grow in it with a certain amount of salt. Salt is bad though. It's, I mean, we need have a little bit of salt. You have a little bit of salt in your, in your you know, blood and, and everything, but, uh, but too much salt is bad. The level of saltiness of the ocean directly is a problem for just about everything but some microbes. So how do we deal with that? The first approach is some plants avoid the salt um, uh, as, as their approach. Now we can do this with a couple different ways. We could have um, phenological adaptations. So phenology, right, is the, is the growingness. So 
So we, we germinate at certain times of the year. We, we um, put up our shoots at certain times of the year. We set flowers at certain times of the year. That timing we'd refer to as phenology. And, um, and, and it's, it's the expression, well, yeah, no, never mind. Okay, so a classic one for me would be Juncus, uh, this is a small little, small statured plant, little short, a Juncus buffonus that, um, you know, is, is, is smaller than the palm of your hand, only gets a few inches tall, and pretty much grows when the rains have come, right? So they, very quick growing plant, grow really fast, set seed, boom, do it. And so essentially, that guy's avoiding the salt by, by doing most of its growing in the wet time of the year, right? When, when those salts have mostly been washed away. So they're not in the, they're not at high concentrations. So they're, and then, and then when the salt does come, that plant might be in the salt marsh, but that plant is gonna be in the form of a seed, right? A resting seed and a resistant protective coating waiting for those rain, the fresh water to come. So that's one approach. Another approach would be some type of physiology that can allow you to do your stuff while there's salt water around you or, or near you. And so that we typically talk about excluding uh, the salt. So for example, Spartina, has, and I'll use Spartina, some of these, some of these plants use multiple um, approaches, multiple techniques have multiple adaptations. But um, one of the things Spartina does is never lets water, never lets salt water come into its roots. So it selectively lets the water in, does not let the salt in. So we're excluding the salt water from getting to its, its uh, internal goings on. Another option is just to say, that's fine. I'm gonna tolerate a bunch of uh, salt. I'm gonna suck it up, but, but I'm gonna do something with it. So in the case of things like Atroplex, uh, Spartina, if we go out there and walk around, you look at the leaves, a lot of times the leaves will look white. And if you look really closely, it's because there's all these shiny things on it. It's actually salt crystals. So what some plants do is they take that water up and then they really quickly squeeze it out internally and they push the salt out. So it's, it's, they have it internally, but they rapidly get rid of it. And so we call that secretion. Another approach is you take all that salt and you don't push it outside of your body yet. You put it into one, like you say, your pinky finger. You put it into your pinky. Put all the salt in your pinky. And then once it's packed full of salt, you let your pinky dry up and die. So salicornia will do this. Well, the, well the, it'll essentially shed a stem or two and that, you know, with, with high levels of salts in the stem. Another approach is to have sort of a salty innards, but you have it minimally salty. So we take in all this water, so we have taken the salt water, but then we take in uh, lots of water all the time, and we are a so-called succulent, right? So the, the, the stem, the tissues, there's a lot of water in there. And the idea is we're essentially diluting the concentration of the salt to a level that is less physiologically problematic. The problem with, uh, now, so those ones I just talked about are salt adaptations. So that's, that's for our salt marsh. Not just salt marsh, other, other areas around the world have salty soils and stuff, but, but especially classic for salt marsh. Anoxia is a problem for every single wetland, no matter where you are. Salt marsh, um, uh, freshwater marsh, whatever. Again, this is a property of these wetland systems. And it's not a bad thing. It's just a, it's just the reality of the of the system. So we need to deal with these low oxygen conditions. We have a lot of rotting, decaying matter, right, in the sediments. We maybe don't have a high amount of water movement, so we're not getting a lot of oxygen-rich water coming over, and um, that's a challenge. So again, just like we talked about before, we could have we could have people that or, or, or organisms that just avoid the stress in the first place through various tricks or you have an ability to face it head on and deal with it. So the avoidance, um, again, 
just like just like the juncus we talked about before the salt you you only grow when it's when it's the really rainy time when the river's flowing hard or whatever or in the parts of the marsh that are that are oxygen rich so you just avoid um, being at the so generally speaking the hardest times for our part of the world is going to be summer and fall because summer and fall we have the lowest water movements we have the least number of storms that would be disturbing water, making movement, and, and, and aerating water, aerating soils. That's the hardest time. The easiest time would be winter time. We have all this rain. We have all this disturbance. We have all this wind. We have all this, yeah, all that kind of stuff going. Yeah, the quote unquote rainy time. <clears throat> Remember when we used to have rain in the winter time? You rain. kids, we used to have this thing called snow, right? That kind of stuff. Mars was above the sky. It came from the sky. It's amazing, right? Um, you didn't have to drain your blood every day. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we have this, so there's adaptations to just be there when it's the time of the year when it's not oxygen poor. Or we can have some adaptations to, um, in, in, so for example, we can have these aranchyma, which are classically in Spartina. These are, these are uh, air gaps. These are spaces inside of their tissues inside their stems and so that airspace allow you know oxygenates the uh, helps helps their body function in an oxygen rich environment another thing we've seen with uh, phragmites which is a very common uh, riparian and, and still water wetland uh, plant all around the world phragmites australis um, and Spartina, they can actually make the soil right around their st their roots. They can leak oxygen into the roots and into outside the roots into the soil, and that makes the soil more oxic, more more aerated, which is pretty cool. That actually changes some of the chemistry of the soil and stuff too. Um, so they're actually you can imagine with a, almost like a straw blowing into the soil and the surrounding area to re reduce the anoxic condition. And then tolerance, we have things like in Spartina. Spartina can also do anaerobic physiology. So they can, they can do fermentation uh, a la what some bacteria do. Next, dealing with water movement, a hard thing. You know, if, if we're talking about a steel piece of rebar, maybe not so hard, but if we're a little small plant, especially in a, in a high tidal exchange area, that can be hard. So the first is that, uh, the, fir the first thing most plants do is just, is just they be well stabilized. So they anchor themselves really, really well. This is generally not a hard pack clay type soils, right? Which, which we think of as being hard. These are more muddy type environments. So it's even harder to hold on when you're in mud, right? Because if it starts flowing pretty quickly, you can just be taken out. So the general approach is to have, uh, in these situations, is to have strong structural adaptations. And so here what I'm showing you on the bottom is one of the first uh, experiments I did a long time ago to try to look at this. And so what you see is I've, I've not just sampled the above ground plants. This is a planting experiment I did in a restoration to see, if, see what would be best. And so I planted different areas of the marsh with different mixes of plants. So the one on the left is just pure salicornia. The one in the middle is, uh, the next one is just pure frankinia, another uh, common wetland plant. <coughs> and then a, a third species. And then on the right, it's a, it's a diverse mix of, of plants. Now, this is just one snapshot of the experiment. So, so um, just keep that in mind. But what you see is, uh, and I started off taking a one, one foot by one foot by one foot block of, of mud, cut it out of the marsh. And then I started doing it and I said, oh my God, this is hard. I'm going to give it to my technician to do. So uh, we said, hey, a very nice lady. And she was so sweet and so nice. She'd never say no. I said, can you do this? Sure. And so I go in and I say, hey, where's, where's the data? Oh yeah, I'm still, I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it. Okay, well, great. So I'll come back tomorrow. How's it going? Hey, I'm, 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 still, I'm still working on it. <laughs> so the problem was, um, what we're cutting out here are not just the main roots, which are what most people have looked at, 
we're looking at the root hairs. So all the little teeny fibrous, little teeny sub branches, sub, 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 sub branches of the roots. There's so many micro roots that it was essentially impossible for her to clean them. So she was by hand basically pulling off all these sediment particles off the roots. So then I said, oh, that's crazy. That's too much work. Let's, I want just, let's just do this half of the block. And it's still taking her days and days and days. So, okay, let's just do this half. So eventually we got down to the volume of these, <laughs> of these vials. And that was taken like, you know, a couple hours. So a, a fantastic illustration of how dense these roots are. We see the above ground part of the story and we tend to think as above ground organisms that that's where the story is. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the soil. And so in this case, um, what we're looking at is this incredible root structure. Amongst other things, that helps to anchor these plants, right? In these, you don't see big carrot type roots here, right? Because that wouldn't, that wouldn't really work. As soon as the carrot started to get pulled out, the whole carrot would fall out. Instead, this is like a bunch of little, a thousand micro anchors anchoring yourself in this loose, unconsol less consolidated sediment. And it works really, really well. So, the, so plants are able to hold on um, and do that. Another adaptation is like this guy. Um, oh, there's a lot of biomass, right? A lot of biomass. So maybe here is the heavy, is, is, the, is the high flowing area, but I might be anchored in an area that is uh, less exposed to that hydrological shear. So, okay, so the structural adaptations, we have anchoring roots, and they oftentimes will function as, as uptake roots too. They can bring water in, for example, if, if you're in a dry area. And then this notion of uh, rhizomes that you're seeing, and this is an example of a, of a rhizome, basically, um, which is stems across the surface of the water, or of the, of the surface, so that... Uh, uh, if they move around, the whole plant doesn't rip out. Um, then we have uh, how plants grow. So if they're in a really heavy flowing area, they will tend to um, uh, be packed together. Well, never, never mind. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll just say they reduce drag. So plants can reduce drag. Uh, Frankinia uh, grows together and self crowds and, and helps with that. We can have mutualism, so we can so you can have Frankinia growing next to Frankinia, and so guys standing next to each other are harder to knock down. So that's cool. We can also see that in in a diverse canopy too. So we have our neighbors that are growing like we are, even though it's not our species, it's not our gene pool. Um, we can get benefit from that. When we have really strong currents, though, we're in, in say the mouth of the estuary, the, the most intense area, what we typically see there is very straight up and down, so grass-like morphology. Not a lot of side branches, not a lot of things that would cause extra drag, just pretty much a, a linear up-down structure. The other thing we see is very prostrate, so squeezing the ground, holding onto the ground, so that uh, the surface currents, if you're underwater, are less problematic. Okay, so those are all examples. So we have structural adaptations, growth adaptations, mutualism, and morphological adaptations to deal with hydrological shear. Uh, now, this hydrological, hydrological shear is actually interesting because it's actually one of the unique benefits of a wetland, of a tidal wetland, let's say. This hydrological shear can be used by the plant to get free energy in the form of dispersal. Most of our plants that we have in the salt marsh are not wind dispersed. They're not little teeny tiny seeds that, that blow away on the wind. Instead, they are typically floating seeds. So if they want to get to it, if they want to colonize a new bare area or a new area, they're going to float. So here I'm showing you for scale. That's a one millimeter scale. Some of the seeds we typically get in our salt marsh seed banks, Salicornia, Jaumea, Frankinia, Disticlus. <coughs> and, uh, and, and, and these guys take advantage of this, of this, you know, a lot of water movement. They get the benefit of that. Also, 
what some plants do in these really high shear environments is they just say, that's fine, you can snap off my stem, screw you. <laughs> and that stem will then land, and that stem can generate a new plant. So we call that fragmentation. The classic case for us, it's actually an invader, it's a huge problem for us, but the classic case for us would be Arundo donax. So our invasive Arundo in our, in our streams, the reason it, one of the reasons it's so good is when it breaks off, when a storm happens and the stem, this is, this is a grass, when the stem breaks off, and it floats down, it lands, that stem will re-sprout and turn into a whole new plant. Willows do the same thing. So when we do willow restorations, we'll go out and see our willow restoration um, at some point soon. Uh, when we go out and see that, the way we, what we do is we literally just go to a willow tree, cut the stem, and then go take that stem and jam it in the ground. That doesn't work for most plants. <laughs> most plants, you can't, you can't go to your... Uh, Rose bush, just cut a stem and jam the, the stem in the ground and go, here you go, the rose bush. Right? It'll die in a, in a day or two, right? But these plants that have, have grown up with this hydrological shear, have evolved this hydrological shear, they said, okay, fine, I'm just going with the flow. Right? Go ahead, snap me. So the I Ching is, is one of the, my favorite lines from the I Ching is, uh, bend and be straight, yield and overcome, and that's what these plants are doing, right? So they're kind of taking the movement, just go, yeah, go ahead, break me, dude, screw you, and then break you, ha ha, and now, now that plant that was broken off is going to land somewhere, germinate, and the plant that was snapped, the original plant, if it has enough resources, it'll just send up a new stem. So that fragmentation is a key thing. And then um, uh, this notion of resilience, this is a bit more related to any disturbance. This isn't necessarily just hydrological shear, but um, we can just be a growth dominant. And what we see is in general, um, just like our chaparral, which is heavily driven by fire, these get, in one of the main plant uh, approaches to, to make a living is to be really great re-sprouters, to re-sprout. There's a whole plant got burned up, the stumps left, but then we re-sprout a new plant from our stem. Same thing with our wetland plants. So a lot of them are really good re-sprouters. Again, yep, you're going to snap off my branches. That's fine. I'm going to grow some new branches. And then uh, in general, most of our wetland plants, especially salt marsh plants, clone, the, the tissue we see comes from clonal break, comes from um, non-sexual reproduction, right? Comes from, comes from uh, making more and more tissues, copies of ourselves as opposed to new seeds landing and having new seeds generate the plant tissue that we're typically seeing. Okay, when we talk about animals, what we tend to see in our salt marshes are medium and small bodied animals. We have big bodied, we have coyotes and things too, but, but, but small things tend to dominate. Relative to some of our uh, other marine environments or other terrestrial environments. The medium smallest guys tend to be the residents. These would be the mice, the field mice, and things like that. Larger organisms, again, like our coyotes, those guys tend to be um, occasional visitors during the right tide time. So the coyotes will def definitely come into the salt marsh, but they're going to come in at low tide. And then when the tide starts to come up, they're going to leave. Whereas the small guys typically will build nests that, that may be up in the vegetation, that they can you know, survive being wetted and stuff like that. It's important to note that, again, old school thinking, we tended to focus on the big stuff. We tend to focus always on the big critters. And, uh, you know, that's maybe understandable, but, but most of the story is really in the smaller critters, uh, life history. We also tend to focus on the endangered critters and give a disproportionate amount of attention to the, the critters. And so most of the adaptation stuff we understand are from those guys. Or things with a clear commercial value, craw crawfish in Louisiana, shrimp in Louisiana, that kind of stuff. But just like the plants, the animal patterns are in our tidal salt marshes are driven by tide one of the strongest forcing factors are the daily ups and downs of the tides, just like the plants. The infauna, the animals that are living in the sediment, the worms, uh, those kind of guys, 
the, the crabs, living crab burrows, those guys. Um, those guys generally track with the plant adaptations. So those guys are generally tracking, they're gonna be distributed uh, along with the plants. So when we have certain plant communities, we'll tend to see certain infauna. When we have different plant communities, we tend to see different infauna. And then in general, for most of the, um, a lot of these guys are adapted to dealing with um, rack and detrital food webs. So eating plant tissues or plant tissues that recently died, um, et cetera.